everybody. I am really glad to have you here. I'm going to just take a few moments to welcome people who are joining us right now. Hello. I got tired of taking selfies, so I drew a cartoon this week. I am going to go ahead and flip this around now. Hi. I'm going to set myself up over here. I still can't decide whether I like horizontal or vertical. Seems like people were starting to go, uh, you know, landscape for a while, and then they switched. Let's move this out of the way. Hi, thanks for the heart so early. I didn't even do anything. I appreciate that very much. So let me just, this is like my sixth or seventh periscope now, so I'm starting to get a little bit more comfortable with it. Hi, Ella. Thank you for telling me who you are. I would love to hear names of people, because I can't always tell from your um, you know, handles. So I would love to hear the names of people here. And if this is your very first time um, watching a periscope, I would love to hear that too, because I think this is such a really cool medium, and I'm just always excited when somebody is brand new. Hi, Patty. Hi. And so are you Jennifer, or are you saying hi, Jennifer? Because <laughs> if you're Jennifer, then hey, welcome. Hi, Angela. Good. I'm glad you like this topic. Good, good, good. I'm excited to talk about it too. So I'm going to just take a little bit more time to just say hello. Um, good. Hi. What's your name? CHP2114. What's your name? I'm so excited that brand new people are here. Hi, Laura. Hi, Cheryl. <laughs> there we go. Josanne, Stephanie. Middle school art teacher. Great. First time on Periscope. I'm so excited that you all are here. Well, you, you missed last week. <laughs> yes. Last week, whoo, last week we were, uh, we were bombarded by hundreds of, I think, high school students <laughs> and they were inappropriate. So I am hoping that we, we don't have that problem. I blocked a whole bunch of them last week. I sat down and I wrote all their names down and I blocked them. So hopefully this won't happen this time, but if so, you get to see how I handle myself under pressure and people tailing me to take my shirt off. So, um, okay. So if this is your first time, if this is your first time and you already sort of know me from my website, then I don't need to give you any kind of introduction. Hey, I'm glad you subscribed to my emails. My name is Jennifer Gonzalez. I have a website called Cult of Pedagogy. It is for teachers. I All of my work is devoted to helping teachers do their jobs better. And so... Um, I decided about a month and a half ago that I was getting too many emails from teachers asking for advice on things, and I thought, you know, it doesn't really help anybody else but this one person for me to give them advice one-on-one, uh, -on -one. so why not share my advice with everybody? So I pick one reader question per week, and... Um, I answer it in a live broadcast. And what's great about doing it this way is that not only do a lot of people, more people get to hear it, but I get to get your ideas also. And what I've found on my blog post is that I will put together as good of a blog post as I can. And I'll get as much research together. But then the comments start coming afterwards and people start to share other resources that they know and other advice that they can give for certain situations. And it's wonderful because those blog posts get better over time because of the comments. And that's how I feel about Periscope too, that you all can help me. I can give you my ideas, but then I can get ideas from other people too. And this is definitely one that we all need to share ideas on. So let me tell you about the original email. It is, thank you for sharing. Um, I believe you swipe left or right for iOS or Android or up and down for the other one. And you can share the broadcast and invite your friends to come in and watch. So here was the original um, email that I got. This is from a parent of a sixth grader. And this seems to happen so much. And I was a middle school teacher. And so this happened a lot to students of mine. Thanks for sharing. Is that I would, kids would get started in middle school and their parents or their teachers or both would want them to have more independence and not have so much hand-holding. And the students' grades would just bottom out because they couldn't handle the, the level of independence that was required. It's a combination. So this parent um, is basically stuck at the end of a marking period realizing that her son is failing most of his classes. And her son is uh, very smart, has never really struggled in school, and he aces all of his tests, but he cannot get the work turned in. He just forgets it, loses it, doesn't hand it in. 
and the the parent is at her wit's end. And so this is a problem that a lot of parents face, but it's a problem that a lot of teachers face too. We have students who we see them doing the work and then when we have the pile later to grade, that student's paper is not there in it. And so uh, one thing that you should know is that most weeks when I do these, I do a little bit of research and I just try to find some good online resources to kind of help add on to whatever I would have normally said. And so most of the time anyway, I'm going to have a digital download that you can grab while you are, um, yeah, while you're watching to follow along or you can just grab it later. So if you go to my website, cultofpedagogy.com, it's C-U-L-T, cult of O-F, and then pedagogy, the art of teaching, P-E-D-A-G-O-G-Y dot com slash Periscope. That is where I keep a running list of all the resources that I've shared in past Periscopes. And I've got tonight's already loaded up. And so it's just a list of the four options that I'm going to talk about tonight. I feel like this parent has four different options for dealing with this. And I would love to hear other ideas from you all as well for what you think this parent should do. Because I think if a lot of teachers are watching, then you have all definitely had, you know, this student before, and I'm sure some of you have, um, have found solutions. So I would love to hear about those. Also, if you are, um, if you want to tell a friend about this later on and you can't find the Periscope, all of my Periscopes are, are collected on a, a separate page. It's a website called Catch with a K, K-A-T-C-H dot M-E slash cult of pedagogy it's just an archive of all my old periscopes because they disappear from your phone after 24 hours but they're there so if you wanted to send somebody to that replay and there's actually a link to it um, on this download okay so i feel like the parent i'm going to speak to this from a parent's point of view and all of us who are teachers chime in if you think there's something else that this teacher should do so i feel like this parent has four options the first one being to work with this student, and I'm referring to him as a him because that's the letter that I got, but obviously this would work for girls too. Work with him to create a plan of action. This particular, there there are um, dozens of different possible reasons why this could be happening. It could be something sort of complicated in that they, they just are having trouble with attention and they're having trouble really sticking to their work, or it could be as simple as just Maybe there's somebody in the class who they don't like to walk past when they have to hand the work in. Sometimes it's something that simple. And so if this parent has not yet had a real heart-to-heart with her son about what is going on, then that is obviously important. And thank you, Michelle. And to me, this seems like an obvious solution, but I think sometimes some parents automatically go to the punishment and saying, well, you better get your work done and you know we're going to have to take away this and take away that. And those things can be effective, but they may not solve an underlying problem. So start, I would say, by strategizing with your student, and especially if we're talking about a middle or high school student. But even, you know, sometimes I say middle and high school, and my son's a third grader and my daughter's a fourth grader, and they've got very logical minds. I think they could really contribute a lot in terms of what do you think the solution should be. So, um, hey, sorry, I have a friend of Ruth who is in here. So, so talking to the student about what do you think should be done? What do you think should be done? They might say, one of the, the I, I linked to an article basically here um, where a parent had gone to a forum and said, I have this same problem with her eighth grade son. And it's a long, long, long forum of a lot of parents and teachers giving her suggestions. So I would say definitely link to that for option one because they give so many different suggestions. But some of the ones that came up in, in this thread were, one, see if the teachers will let him turn everything in at the beginning of a school day. If this is a student to who has a lot of teachers, see if they can turn everything in at the beginning of the school day. Uh, Ruth, we're going to get to that one next because we're going to talk about finding out what's going on at school. Um, see if the student can come up with their own consequence. You know, say, what consequence do you think would work? Because in a lot of cases, this student will will say, I want to change. I want to fix this. I just don't know. So you can say, well, what do you think would work? For some kids, that may not. For some kids, it may be working their way towards a reward instead of a consequence. Uh, another thing that was recommended in this thread was 
considering whether or not you need to seek a diagnosis for ADD or ADHD, that this could be an attention problem and a, and a focus problem. So that's something else to consider. So that would be the first thing. And I'd say definitely go take a look at that thread because it, it's, a, it's an interesting conversation between all these different parents and it gets a little contentious at one point, but they are able to get it back together. And I love watching people behave themselves nicely on the internet. So if for nothing else, take a look at that. It almost gets snitty at some point. So option one is See if you can strategize with your child. Option two, find out what's happening at school. Now, in this option on the handout I have, I don't have an article linked. I just, one of the things that I read a lot in that thread was this parent said, when my kid got to middle school, what I heard from teachers and from and about a lot of teachers in middle school was that a lot of them were saying, it is not my job to tell students when it's time to hand in homework. So I have to have a little so a soapbox moment here. I, I think that because I was a middle school teacher, I understand that we want our students to be responsible. However, we're talking about teachers who literally refuse to say, okay, it is time for you to hand in your homework, that there was supposed to be some sort of magical moment that students just knew. Maybe it was part of the class. In a basket or something. But really, is that the hill you want to die on? I mean, honestly, I am so scatterbrained sometimes that I write things on my hand like I'm 15 because I know that between the time I'm in this room and that room, I'm going to forget them. So how are we supposed to expect a hormone-laden child to not know when it's time to just hand it in? We've got so many distractions. I really, really do not think that you are weak as a teacher if you simply say, I need the homework right now. And even to say it a second time, because somebody was spacing out. By the way, we're turning in the homework now. It's just, you're just being a nice human being, honestly. Now, yes, you can tell students and you still don't get the work. But I'm saying, if that's the problem in this one student school, because the teachers are digging their heels in on that, they don't want to say that it's time to turn the homework in. Yeah, even in grad school, you've got to, you know, just say, prompt them a little bit. So... I think that that's kind of a ridiculous policy. But my bigger point on option two is find out exactly what is happening in school. And I think it's definitely worthwhile to have a meeting with the teacher because a lot of times kids will come home and say, oh, well, she doesn't let us do this, this, and that. And I know as a teacher, kids can misrepresent what you do and what you say. They can misinterpret or miss they they can miss a lot of the nuance in what you say so it would be great to have a three person conversation about in the teacher's classroom ideally so that you can say where do you hand the homework in it may be that the student has just misunderstood all year where they're supposed to turn something in or if you're having students hand things in digitally there could be some confusion with how that works so just make sure that you the parent the teacher and the student are all working with the same facts, that you are all talking about apples and not some of you talking about oranges. So, okay, I just got a good comment. The conversation about engagement needs to precede the conversation about accountability. This, okay, this is a big topic because we could very well be dealing with a student who is bored to tears in school, especially if he aces all of his tests and there is a much larger conversation going on among educators about whether or not homework should even be assigned, whether or not uh, we should even be giving grades, and, and whether or not students are really engaged in their work. I think that is a valuable conversation for sure. However, right now, what we're dealing with is, is students who are working within a current system and may end up having more serious consequences because they can't get those executive functions in order. They can't just do the basic compliance stuff of just turn it in on this day when the person says it. And, you know, I know there's a lot of debate over whether there's a, enough value in that. I personally think there is. We're, we're <laughs> quick sidebar, we're waiting to buy a house right now. And the bank just called us today and said that the seller's agent still hasn't turned in her paperwork. And so the whole thing might be delayed. And I thought, you know what? Compliance, like just basic 
when my vet gives me medicine to give my dog and I don't comply, he stays sick. So I really think there is some value in a person developing the skills that they need, whatever they are, to be able to just do the thing that they're supposed to do when they're supposed to do it. So with that said, find out what's happening at school. Have a conversation with the teacher. Make sure everybody is clear at least what the expectations are. And also, you know, Sometimes the kids think that the teachers are more rigid than they are. I don't think I can speak for all of you, but let me know if you agree with this. If there is one tiny little change we can make that's going to get that one kid who never turns any work in to turn it in, aren't we going to do it? Because really, it's just, you know, if it's something really small and not that inconvenient, then I, I know I want my kids to turn stuff in. So, you know... I think a lot of times uh, kids are intimidated by certain teachers and they're afraid to ask. So sometimes if you just say, hey, can I can I do this? Then the teacher will be like, fine. Um, hang on one sec. Okay. So that's the second thing. First thing is strategize with your student for what can be, you know, what you can do. And second is find out what's going on at school. So we're all talking about the same thing. The third option is to let him suffer the natural consequences. And this is something a lot of parents don't want to do. A couple of months ago on my site, I reviewed a book called The Gift of Failure by Jessica Leahy. And I put a link to it on this uh, download. A lot of people saying yes to that with those hearts. So if you're new to Periscope, these hearts are when people tap the screen. That's just a way of saying it's like a thumbs up or a like on Facebook. So the premise of this book, The Gift of Failure, is that far too many parents want to rescue their children from any kind of pain or consequence. And so we will sweep in at the last minute and make everything okay, and then they don't ever learn because we have rescued them. And so... And, and yes, on that post that I linked to, I interviewed her. We had a nice long talk on the podcast, and um, she talked about her own experiences. I asked her my own questions as a parent about my own doubts about, really, can I just let them fall? It's the whole idea of, of when your kid is walking. Do you let them fall down, or do you catch them every single time? And how does that facilitate learning? And so if we're talking about a sixth grader, I feel like middle school is such an important time for kids to actually make some of these big mistakes and then pick themselves back up. When I was in eighth grade, I I got a D in algebra. I was put in eighth grade algebra, and I didn't do what I was supposed to do. And I got a D, and we had a meeting, and they decided to take me out and have me start again as a ninth grader. And I was pretty embarrassed because I was, you know, one of the really smart kids in my school, and all my friends were in it, and and I got put back into pre-algebra. But that was a good experience. Exactly. Middle school, there's not a whole lot of lifelong consequences for screwing up in middle school. So let them make their big mistakes because high school, you know, permanent record. It's, you know, high, it's transcripts that are going to college. And so, you know, honestly, when I got into high school, I took five math classes. I doubled up on math my sophomore year so that I could be in calculus with my friends as a senior. I don't know if I would have been that motivated had I kind of been able to, if if my mother had gone and said, please keep her in algebra, we can get a tutor and we can get her caught up. I don't think I would have had the math foundation. First of all, I really learned it well when I took it again as a ninth grader, but if she had, you know, just taken over for me anyway. So one, one thing you could do is just let it, let it go. Let him completely fall on his face as a sixth grader. There may be kind of serious consequences. He may not get into the advanced groups next year. But if you let, I think if you let his teachers know ahead of time, this is what I am planning on doing. Please give him consequences. Sometimes we've got teachers who are going to be like, oh, we'll just let it go this time. And then it's like, no, we wanted you to give consequences. So... Oh, we're having problems with grades 11 and 12. And that's, see, here's the thing with grades 11 and 12 with the natural consequences. I think there's, everybody's all freaked out about college and, you know, what if they don't get into college and how, they're so close to graduating. How can I let them, right? How can I let them fall down now? Because it could mean not getting into a good college. So maybe they don't get into a good college. Think about all the adults, you know, who got into a good college and dropped out and then went to a different thing and had a whole different situation. And they think, right. And they think I learned an important lesson then, 
you know, you, you've got some students who are ushered all the way through until they finally get into that awesome college. And then we have college professors who are saying they're dealing with helicopter pa parents in college, parents who are calling for their children in college to advocate for a higher grade or let them make up this missed homework. Can you imagine? I mean, I think this is, this is becoming a really, really big problem. When does that stop? At some point, they have to fall down at least a little bit. So letting him suffer the natural consequences as a sixth grader, it may be an option. I would definitely say, um, yeah, Ruth, I want to talk about your situation. This drama chick here who's commenting, she is a 12th grade uh, English teacher, and she's pretty tough on them. And what she's told me is that some of them are, are not failing necessarily, but are getting pretty low marks from you for the first time in their school careers, and they're flipping out. But they're, what's ultimately happening is that they're starting to work a little bit harder. So I, I think we need to not be so afraid of, of failure. Okay, good. I knew I got that, that situation right. Okay, last option. And I really, really do think that this is not for everybody, but when I read this story... I felt like it was, you know, a possibility for some people. And I know that, um, hang on one sec. Okay. I know that this is not for everybody. I don't think this is for me. Uh, option four is consider homeschooling. When anybody ever suggests homeschooling to me, I kind of, uh, just, mommy likes her alone time very much. <laughs> I don't know that I could be home alone with my kids all day. But I read this article that I linked to in this uh, document called What We Did When Our Son Was Failing School. And this was kind of the, uh, thank you, this is kind of the engagement issue. This is somebody who had an eighth grade son who was ju just hated school. I mean, it was the same kind of situation, though. He could test well, but he just really dreaded going, really dragged his feet, and, and just they noticed that his personality was just starting to go down and down and down in terms of the light that was inside him. And they they thought about it for a while, and they decided to give it a try. They made the arrangements that they needed to to have him finish the school year. They pulled him out partway through the year, have him finish the school year with an online program. Um, he was a baseball player, so he was pretty involved in athletics and was able to get some support there. Anyway... It turned out really well. And this mother talked about how guilty she felt when she looked back on the last four years when she had started to notice a change in him and how she avoided she avoided homeschooling because of the inconvenience and not realizing how really good it would be for him and how 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 much of a good option that could be and how much of his original personality would come back out. Uh, and it also ended up making him very self-motivated and very self-directed. So uh, <clears throat> I do not have a lot of expertise on um, homeschooling, but it's I think it's, it, it could be that it's just not a good fit for your child, the school that he is in. So those are my four suggestions. And there is a, if you go to cultofpedagogy.com slash periscope, you'll have a link to that document. Um, thank you all so much for coming, and <clears throat> thank you. Thank you, and I will be back next week. And if you have never come to my website, Cult of Pedagogy, by Ruth, C-U-L-T-O-F-P-E-D-A-G-O-G-Y, uh, lots and lots of stuff for teachers, and maybe we will talk about that homeschool issue some more some other time because it's a pretty hot topic. Have a great night, everybody. And now, as always, I will attempt to turn this off, which always takes me forever. Have a good night. No, that's flipping. Swipe.